Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar in our series of four. You can register for our webinars, follow La Union across the Atlantic, and check the weather data being uploaded daily from her voyage 2015 at seaformation.com. That's S-E-A formation.com. Today, we look at some of the work that will occur during the entire voyage, the study of the weather at sea and the levels of plastics in the surface seawater. Both relate to the health of our environment and the important work that is being done to address climate change and improve the quality of this vast habitat that feeds us. I'd like to start off with a bit of context for those who are hearing about the ship for the first time. The original La Union was built in 1779. She was one of four frigates commissioned by King Louis XVI to bring troops and naval support to General George Washington. The colonies were in desperate need. Their needs were met thanks in large part to the Marquis de Lafayette. He negotiated the French contribution on behalf of his father figure, Washington. Lafayette made the voyage and succeeded in his mission of support aboard L'Hermione. For that reason, the city of Rochefort in France chose to rebuild this ship, which was fabricated in the same location as the original. Today, L'Hermione is heading to the United States in celebration of Franco-American friendship. This friendship, it might be argued, started with Lafayette and Washington. L'Hermione is a symbol of what can be achieved when we all work together towards a shared common goal. One of Lafayette's mottos is que non, which means why not? Indeed, why not use this incredible story of defying the odds to build this ship and launch a new conversation among classrooms on both sides of the pond, the Atlantic. We encourage you to continue to investigate and learn through our website. Please take the time to leave us your contact information and we'll publish a list of participating schools so that a shared curriculum might be conceived for the next school year. Joining us today is Abby Barrows from Adventurers and Scientists for Conservation. She will help us understand the environmental work being done as we collect water samples along the route. Welcome, Abby. Also with us is Jim Luciani of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. He will answer our questions regarding the weather data we are collecting from the ship and the data buoys we are releasing along the way. Welcome, Jim. We also hope to hear from the ship herself. They will be dialing into the webinar from off the coast of Portugal and, with any luck, will give us an update on how their work is progressing. Before we address your questions that have been coming in from our site, cformation.com, and via Twitter at c underscore underscore formation, I'd like to show you a short video that was sent in from the ship this morning. Welcome, everyone. Uh, Welcome aboard the Almion. We are, uh, we've been sailing for uh, just a little under two days. We're uh, just about to cross uh, the, uh, the barrier from the Bay of Gascogne to uh, the into the Atlantic. As you can tell, there's sunshine, so we're all happy. Um, but you can, may be able to hear in the background that the engines are going while we film, and uh, that's because we're actually trying to make some good way to get far enough south to avoid a, a larger storm that's, uh, that's headed our way. The sailing has been wonderful so far, and. Uh, we will talk more about propulsion in another webinar, but today we want to focus on, on climate and environment. Um, I have uh, with me uh, Manon Bernard, who will uh, be one of the uh, volunteers aboard the ship that you'll meet uh, during the webinars. And uh, she and I will be doing uh, the water sampling and the, the releasing of uh, data buoys along the trip, uh, which we'll talk more about when we actually see the, the material. The, the ship has 80 people aboard, as you may have seen from the materials you read. She is a, a replica of the ship that brought Lafayette to the United States in 1780. So this is a historical moment as well as an opportunity for all of us to learn something about uh, the world that, in, that surrounds us. So, uh, you know, I wish Nicolas could have been here to help us, but because uh, he's going to be very involved with the data buoys and the release of the data buoys, they weigh a ton and we're going to need a lot of people to maneuver them. But uh, uh, hey, Nicolas, come here, come here, come here. This works really well. Nicolas is actually on duty right now, which is why he's wearing a harness, uh, but he's on, on a break. We call it a fika in honor of the Swedes that have helped rig the ship. But uh, Nicolas, welcome aboard. Nicolas Chabon is, it will be, is one of the volunteers that has agreed to, to help us with all the data collection uh, uh, over the entire trip. So are you guys ready? Yeah. All right. Let's go, let's go look at the data buoys. Uh. 
So here we are in the in the voilerie. This is the stock room, if you will, but it also stores the sails. We're in the bow of the ship, um, and uh, there are two. two Sorry types about of that, buoys that we wanted to show you today, but one type, the, uh, the they're called drifters, uh, and they're basically released into the ocean. They have a um, uh, a bag at the bottom that holds them in place. Um, those are stored way up in the bow, and they're really in a nice, neat spot. And since we're expecting some bad weather in a, in a, within the next 24 hours, we don't want to start moving things. Um, so we'll have to show you those later. But we did want to show you these. They're called Argos. And there's a difference between these and the others. These, when we release them, actually dive into the, uh, into the ocean and go down a certain depth to um, measure uh, temperature and salinity at different levels in the, in the ocean, as I understand it. Um, and I'll leave this, the experts' questions to, to Jim, who's on the, on the webinar, to be more precise. But I understand that's the big difference between this and the, and the others. These also uh, drift uh, uh, much more quickly than the, um, than the drifter buoys that are made to, to stay fairly stationary. All of these buoys are part of a larger network. Uh, there, uh, there are tens of, or dozens of them across the entire Atlantic Ocean. And that network feeds a system of climate information that uh, goes through Europe and then helps the United States as well to understand global uh, changes in climate from year to year. Um, I honestly don't know how to set this off. We just found the on-off switch, which is like really cool because we know we can get at least that far. Um, but we promise to do our homework, uh, if you do yours, to, uh, to follow us as these buoys get released. We're going to be posting on our site when the, the dates and times when these get released. And you'll be in instructed by Jim, and you'll also be able to find it on our website, uh, how to follow the data during the trip. So if you're excited about weather, you're excited about climate, uh, we encourage you to look all that up and, uh, and ask Jim lots of questions. Uh, we're going to put this back where it's safe, up in the hold, and uh, we'll lash her down so that uh, when we want to release her, she'll still be here and be intact. Because when the waves come, things can start to rock and roll. Hey, everybody, we're back here in uh, La Grande Rue. Uh, we're uh, about ready to show you, at least in principle, what we're going to be doing to... Uh, collect water samples along the voyage. So here's the here's the principle. We've got a clean bucket. We've cleaned it uh, uh, so that we don't introduce any other foreign matters into the the, issue, the, uh, the, the taking of the sample. We've got our bottle, uh, which is supposed to be a one liter. This is a half liter. So again, it's just a sampling. And normally we're going to use a, uh, a piece of foil that we're going to stick on top of the cap, underneath the, the bottle cap before we screw it on. Um, so that's the principle. We're going to go grab some water and then we're going to dump the bottle into the water, and we'll see if we can get this done without losing the bucket. Okay, on en a la bouteille. Tu... Ouais. Ouais, tu peux mettre le fond comme ça, ouais. Faire beaucoup de bulles. So what we want to do is make sure that we've got enough water to, to get right to the top before we cap it. We're going to normally put a piece of foil on top, and then we'll put the cap on. Uh, each of these bottles will get labeled so that uh, we know exactly our position, time of day, uh, and that way we'll know sort of... Abby, when she does the work, you're going to hear from her later in the webinar, uh, we'll be able to tell exactly where this came from and uh, uh, you know, what, what are the conditions might have been. Because obviously, if we've got a beautiful sunny day today. Uh, the water's fairly calm. Um, and uh, we'll, hope this, we'll hope this works. So uh, here we're going through the, uh, the, the mess hall. This is where the crew uh, share their meals. And we're going to go through that door into what's called the Grande Chambre, which is where all the navigation equipment is. And I want to show you the weather instruments there. So here's where we navigate and where we, uh, we watch the weather. And I wanted to point out a couple of things that were very important to us. We have, uh, obviously, weather data maps that are sent to us all the time, showing the direction and the, in the force of the wind. We've also got uh, uh, wind direction, true wind, and uh, speeds uh, and directions. And uh, they were also one of the important things is barometric pressure. So we actually have a, uh, a barometer the, um, on board that will give us accurate data regarding uh, uh, atmospheric pressure 
Uh, we'll be also measuring uh, water temperature and uh, uh, air temperature outside. Um, and all of those uh, data points will, will be followed with uh, uh, local position and uh, uh, time of day. Uh, and they'll be uploaded once a day uh, to a, a website that we've been provided by uh, Meteo France. And um, you'll be able to follow all of those, the, that, those uh, weather points uh, as well as the ones from the data police. Well, listen, everyone, uh, thank you for following us around. This is the, this is the stern of the ship now. So you've, you've pretty much walked the entire ship. There are a lot of little places we'll show you in other videos. But this is where the navigation occurs which we'll talk about in another webinar. And uh, I wanted to take a moment to thank Jim and Abby for, for joining us. Uh, really appreciate your expertise, and I hope you get lots of great questions. Um, and I'd also like to thank my son, Ben, for, uh, for stepping in and being my, uh, my land-based security blanket because uh, the connections from the ship are uh, at best uncertain, and uh, we certainly hope to be with you in a few minutes. But uh, if, that, if that fails, I know you're in good hands, and uh, stay tuned. Thanks. All right, I'd like to introduce now James, Luciani, and Abby Barrows, who will be our two panelists today, and they'll be answering your questions. That video should have given you a bit better understanding of the instruments that are being used in these collection processes, and feel free to post any questions you have in the chat window on your panel, and we'll get to them as quickly as we can. Hello. So James, Abby, I hope your your connections are going well, and uh, let's move on to questions. Yes, thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. First question we have is, why is collecting all this weather data so important, and how can we use it as students? Uh, I guess I'll answer that one. This is Jim Luciani. Um, basically, the weather data that we collect uh, goes toward, into the creation of an analysis of the current state of the atmosphere. Uh, and with the forecasting models that we have been developed over the years, um, from that analysis, we apply the forecast models and come up with a pretty accurate forecast out to 72 hours. I think we're pretty good out to that range now. Um, and the way I tell it to the people who we ask to help us by taking these weather observations at sea is, if I know what's happening right now with our good forecast models, I can pretty accurately predict what's going to be happening in the future. But on the other hand, if I do not know what's happening right now, there isn't a chance that I can predict what's going to happen in the future. So the, uh, the, the foundation of a good forecast is a weather observation. And it's same thing goes for the oceans. You need to have an analysis of what's happening in order to uh, apply prediction models to that. All right, on to the next question. How long will these are able to hear that, Mark? Ocean, and how many are there currently in the Atlantic? I guess this one's for me as well. Um, right now, uh, our, we have Argo buoys and these uh, drifting buoys, the SVP drifter buoys. The Argos buoys have a lifespan of about four to five years. Um, and those are the ones that uh, sink down and then come back up uh, after 10 days and transmit the information that they've gathered. And the SVP drifters, basically lasts for about 400 days, that's their projected life. Uh, but they found that in the uh, northern hemisphere, or in the northern latitudes, because of the cold water, uh, they do last longer. So, and they, they have lived up to uh, four years in those northern climes. We do have um, the fixed weather buoys, and those are serviced on a regular basis by the countries that put them out in the water. And uh, basically on a scheduled maintenance uh, thing they they go out and they replace sensors and things like that because of the harsh environment that the ocean can put on a buoy. Um, you need to replace those sensors on a regular basis. And um, occasionally they'll break loose of their mooring or um, they'll have some unscheduled problems, and then it's up to the buoy center to 
be able to schedule and uh, go out and see what investigate the problem and fix it. Right now we have about 107 uh, weather buoys in the U.S. Um, and then we also have some uh, land-based stations that are right along the ocean um, that actually can provide very similar reports to a buoy report. And there's about 30 of those. So, And then uh, Europe has a number of buoys as well. So the total is probably around 200. Wonderful. And, uh, yeah. We have a question for you now, Abby, wondering what we can do to reduce the levels of plastic in our water, and are there some plastics that are worse than others for the environment? Yes, so um, there's quite a few different things that uh, an individual can do to reduce plastic in the ocean. Um, one is just really trying to refuse using plastic as, as much as possible. When you go out to a restaurant, um, ask for no straw. Uh, you know, bring your own bags to the supermarket. Um, just try to refuse single-use plastic as much as possible um, as you can in your life, and that ultimately will uh, help reduce the amount of plastic that makes its way into the ocean. Um, another important um, way you can help that most people aren't aware of is that uh, your synthetic clothing, you know, your favorite yoga pants or your <laughs> running shorts um, are made from synthetic materials and every time you wash those clothings uh, they shed many hundreds and up to a few thousand pieces of plastic each wash and currently there's no um, filtration system in place either in our home washing machines or in our municipal wastewater treatment plant. Um, so those plastics, microplastics, directly make their way to the oceans through our washing machines. So <laughs> there's a few different things you can do. It's, you can try to um, buy natural fiber clothing as much as possible. There's some really great um, natural fiber clothing, you know, wool instead of polar fleece. Um, um, and hemp and linen and some a lot of the materials out there that are not going to be con contributing to ocean plastic. Um, and also keeping your eye out, there's a, sort of a lot of new technology coming out for um, putting higher, um, finer mesh filtration in people's washing machines, so keeping an eye out for that and also you know talking to your local reps about that and seeing what can be done on a more town or, or city level to um, increase the amount of filtration happening for the treated waste that goes right into our oceans. Um, and in terms of plastic, uh, three, six, and seven are some of the the nastier plastics. Um, but I really think that all you know plastics one through seven are really um, all made with um, toxic chemicals, and many of those uh, chemicals have uh, known harmful health effects. Um, so uh, in terms of these o plastics making their way to the oceans, they all seem to be leaching and absorbing many of the chemicals in the marine environment. Um, so it's best to avoid plas all plastics as much as possible, um, but uh, three, six, and seven, and also one are some of the nastier ones, um, and also those are the ones that are much harder to recycle um, usually. Thank you, Abby. I've got another related question here. We saw during the video the bottling process that they went through, and Mark explained for us the uh, using the foil to seal the caps, and they'll take location data and weather temperature data to associate with the bottles. Once those bottles reach the U.S., uh, where will they go? What will happen to them? And what exactly are you looking for uh, in the samples? Um, okay, so yeah, so I've been receiving um, hundreds of samples from all over the world, and those bottles end up on uh, my doorstep in Deer Isle, Maine. Um, I live on a little island off the coast of Maine, um, and I have a laboratory set up where uh, once I receive the samples, I use a vacuum pump filtration system, and uh, which is basically uh, using a very contaminant-free environment and glassware dumping the water through a 0.45 micron, so it's a really fine mesh medical grade filter, um, and passing the water through the filter. 
and um, putting the filter on a glass petri dish and letting it dry for at least 24 hours and then using a microscope to uh, read the filter like a, a, like a very small book and go back and forth along the filter and just scan and categorize any plastics that I may find. Um, and I usually I categorize them by shape and color um, because at this point we don't have um, an immediate way to do polymer characterization to find out what types of plastic we're looking at. Um, but I do have a lot of uh, system methods in place to make sure what I'm counting is plastic. Um, and whenever I'm in doubt, I just don't count it. And overall, we're finding um, plastic in 95% of um, the samples. And sorry about that. Um, and uh, it's uh, And uh, we've counted over 6,000 pieces of plastic um, to date from those samples. And does that answer the second part of the question? I, I couldn't hear the whole part of the second, second part of the question. On to the next question here. Uh, regarding the buoys, Jim, are there a mo how many countries are participating in the release of these kind of data buoys, and is that data shared internationally among the scientific community? Uh, yes, the, uh, there's a data buoy cooperation panel, or DC DBCP. It's an international program, and it uh, coordinates the use of the independent buoys <laughs> to observe the atmospheric and oceanic, oceanic conditions over open oceans. And right now we have about 27 countries that participate, and it's shared uh, through the, the international community on the, the JCOMS uh, website, which will be on the uh, printed versions of the answers here. And Argo is an, also an international program, and they are used to collect the temperature and salinity profiles of the upper part, and it's also shared on that same website. And they record temperature and salinity measurements as they work their way up. I think we'll go into that a little bit more later on. So yes, it's an international cooperation. Right now about 27 countries are uh, doing this together and all the data is shared among each other. Um, all the resources and costs are also shared. Regarding the data collection, has there been anything surprising seen from the data that is collected by the buoys? Any uh, unexpected results? Um, well, you know, I'm not a buoy expert. I'm more of a meteorological expert. Um, but I, I'm sure they have found a lot of interesting developments uh, based on their uh, findings here. I know salinity is a big uh, focus for the international scientific community, uh, and I'm sure the data has been invaluable in making a lot of predictions about what's going to happen to the environment in the future and what's happening to it right now. I hope that answers it. Thank you, James. Abby, are you still there? Uh, everyone listening, Abby's location yep. is in the middle of a, a windstorm and they were worried about losing power. Yes, and there's big booms of thunder. I'm not sure if the, the audio is picking it up, but it's pretty dramatic here right now. And I'm staring out at the ocean and big rollers are coming in and uh, it's pretty pretty exciting spring storm here. We have a question here coming in from a listener. Why is the salinity of the oceans a concern now? Are our oceans getting saltier overall? 
Well, yes, the oceans are actually, I think it's the opposite. They're worried about them, uh, the salinity becoming less as more of the ice melts and uh, it has fresh water trapped in it, which will decrease the salinity a, a little bit, which affects ship population or uh, fish populations and things like that. So I think that's uh, one of the focuses is to see exactly what is going on. And uh, the more you know about it, the more uh, concrete answers you get for uh, the questions that are being asked about global warming and things like that. I think that's hopefully that answered that one. Okay, Abby, here's another question for you. Okay. Are we seeing plastics in our food chain yet? And if so, is anyone talking about regulation to have it on labels where people buy their food? Hmm. Oh, that's a great question, and it's sort of a depressing question, um, and particularly because I, I live in a fishing village where it's the livelihood of um, most everyone I know. Uh, there's been a lot of studies coming come, that have come out in this past year, um, and I think we'll start to see a lot more uh, looking at microplastic ingestion throughout the food web. Um, personally, here in Blue Hill, I've been working with another organization where we've been looking at some of the filter feeders like oysters, mussels, and clams, and also lobsters and mackerel, and we're finding plastics in every single animal. Um, and so the next question there is, you know, are these plastics actually hanging out in the gut of the animal um, and therefore being consumed by the other animals in the, in the marine environment and by humans ultimately? Or was, were these guts, uh, the plastic in the gut just as we um, harvested the animal? And I think there's, uh, I think it's a bit of both. I think that some of these microplastics are so small um, some studies have shown that they are relocating within the circulatory system of um, some of the animals. So that's really concerning because of the toxins that are associated with these plastics and the possible health effects on the animal itself and on any animal that eats um, the <laughs> creature that has ingested the plastic. Um, so leaching out some, some of these toxins that might be leaching out can have serious developmental effects, um, you know, endocrine disruption, uh, and uh, a lot of them are carcinogenic. So it's a pretty major concern for the health of our seafood species and for, the, for human health. Um, and at this point, there has been, to my knowledge, there hasn't been any um, discussion about uh, labeling. Uh, you know, already people have a, there's a little bit of uh, uh, chain of custody of where animals came from, but at this point I haven't sampled any ocean or any body of water that has not had plastic in it, so uh, <laughs> almost anywhere that the seafood may be harvested from, they have the pen potential of um, having ingested plastic from the, from the marine environment. In regards to the water sampling program, are there other groups besides yours that are, are doing this research uh, around the world? Uh, yes, but not on the scale that Adventures and Scientists for Conservation has been doing it. Um, there's been a lot of momentum being gained in this field. Um, people are getting really ex excited and scared about uh, a lot of the findings from um, microplastic surface research. There's also been studies of people doing deep sea uh, sediment grabs and looking at plastic content in some of the deeper areas of the ocean and we're finding plastics everywhere um, at this point. And um, there's also been freshwater studies and Adventures in Scientists for Conservation is also expanding into freshwater so we can sort of do a source to sea and see where um, a lot of these plastics might be coming from. So uh, overall um, there, there is more and more research um, happening around microplastics and is also a great um, 
chance for citizens to be involved in the sort of um, surface sampling because it's pretty straightforward. Um, but in terms of other research groups, um, I think that our uh, program is quite unique, our project is quite unique, and that uh, we're really looking, we're not just towing a net over the surface, which is also a very great way to figure out what, you know, the concentration of plastics out there. But since we're actually taking a whole water, you know, a liter of water and filtering that liter of water from whatever area um, in the world, we're getting a really clear snapshot of what is happening in these very fine pinpoints all over the world. And um, we're also looking at plastics, um, much smaller plastics than many of the other studies because of our very fine mesh filter that we use in the lab. Another question we have here, is there any way for an individual to become part of the collection program uh, when they're traveling? Absolutely. Um, that's what we're all about, getting um, more and more people involved and switched on um, with this research. You can go to the Adventure, Adventures and Scientists for Conservation website, which is adventurescience.org. Um, and if you go on to our work um, and current projects, there's a volunteer sign-up sheet. Um, and you just fill out a few things about your trip. And uh, then we have a coordinator that will be in touch with you and step uh, walk you through the protocols and um, provide the data sheets and necessary um, information that you'll need to uh, correctly sample for our project. As a final note, Jim, I'd like to give you a chance to uh, say any closing remarks and uh, information on how people can keep in contact with the data collection that is going on. Okay. Uh, well, I want to thank you for uh, allowing me to participate in the call. Um, I hope uh, I've given a little information. Like I say, my uh, focus mainly is meteorology, but uh, and I don't honestly know everything about the buoys. Uh, I just try to get ships to sign up and help out by deploying the buoys as they go along. But you can uh, resource the data at the HTTP, this is the buoy data, slash www.jcomops.org backslash dbcp. And to follow along the ship for the weather, you can go to the, uh, the website for the ship as well. But you can also follow along with uh, sailweather.com. That's S-A-I-L-W-X dot com. And that's for the weather observations. And uh, Abby, for you as well, um, please take this, this time to say anything you'd like to about adventurers, adventurers and conservationists for science and uh, the work they do and uh, and your involvement with them. Okay. Um, well, they're a phenomenal organization, and their website is quite lovely to look at, lots of photos. Um, they really have been working hard to mobilize the outdoor community to gather and share scientific data to drive conservation around the world. And that's really what our goal is with the Microplastics Project is to engage people um, who might not otherwise be conducting scientific research as they're out, um, you know, exploring these remote corners of the, of the world um, and have their data really uh, have uh, authentic audience and have a meaningful impact on um, conservation and uh, legislation around the world. Um, and there's, uh, they have a few different different uh, different projects that people can be involved in. So if you're not feeling that microplastics is your cup of tea, um, go check out their website and see if there's something that you could do to help um, contribute to one of their other research projects. Um, you know, if you're going to be going hiking or uh, just going on some adventure, even if it's in your backyard, you can um, contribute to these projects. Uh, Abby, I'd, I'd like to bring up one actual question here that just came in late breaking that I think is of importance. Do your results get reported back to the federal, to, to a federal department or to the federal government? And which branch of the government should we as the public be looking to press for action? 
That is a great question. Um, and uh, at this point, um, the results, uh, I let the um, adventurer who collected the sample, I do a results email and sort of let you know what we found. Um, I also have a map that um, any adventurer can look at and look at all the other samples that have happened around the world and see how many pieces of plastic were found on, in, in, from each sample. Um, and we do ultimately um, hope to publish um, our research um, once we uh, sort of have enough uh, of uh, a higher number of samples per ocean in the in the world, um, and this is also all this uh, all of the data and results um, from the study um, can be shared um, within Reason and um, uh, used uh, to support um, state legislation around plastic bag bans or um, single you know styrofoam bans or uh, introducing a bag tax and things like that. Um, depending on your state and I guess on the federal level, um, uh, I think that the uh, EPA um, uh, could be one place to um, um, use this data um, for positive change and also the um, USDA as well um, and uh, locally or state statewide um, most um, Houses have a uh, environmental committee, um, and that's a great way to, as a citizen, to go and speak to uh, your local legislators about the results from your own project. You know, you can take 10 water samples um, if you live in, you know, New Jersey, and uh, then go in uh, to your le local legislation office and speak to the results of what you found. And I think that would ha has a huge impact of being a citizen and also being able to have scientific data to stand behind um, positive conservation change locally. Thank you, Abby. Uh, and thank you, Jim, for joining us today. This was a great conversation. Thank you for your enthusiastic participation, everyone who submitted questions. If we did not get to one of them uh, and it was not answered during this webinar, please check back to the cformation.com website within the next week where we will be posting the answers to all the questions that came in. Thank you again to Abby Barrows and Jim Luciani. Uh, taking the time to be with us today is greatly appreciated. Thank you. You're welcome. We invite all of you to join us on May 5th when we will be looking at navigation and how it has changed from the 18th century to today and what is still the same. It's easy to register, just follow the link from the cformation.com website. On behalf of the crew aboard L'Hermione and the team supporting them in France and the United States, thank you all for joining us. This is Ben Jensen for Mark Jensen aboard the ship. Have a great day, everyone. I'd also like to apologize that we weren't able to communicate with the ship live today. Um, we will work out the kinks and hopefully be talking with them on May 5th. I hope to see you all there again. Thank you very much.